Why do moving charges produce magnetic fields? Do they? <laughs> in this video, I wanna throw in a brand new perspective using Einstein's relativity. Now, before we start, Einstein's gonna ask us, hey, why do you even say that? Why do you say moving charges produce magnetic field? And our answer to that could be, because if you have a moving charge, let's say you have a current carrying wire and you place it next to a magnetic needle, that needle gets deflected. So it certainly acts like a magnet and therefore we say it produces a magnetic field. Another example could be that if you have another moving charge close to a current carrying wire, it gets deflected by the current, due to the current carrying wire. Again, how do you explain that without using magnetic fields? And Einstein comes back and says, what if I can explain all of this without a magnetic field? What if I can explain all of this just by using Coulomb's law? Well, I'll, I'll be very intrigued. I'll say, Einstein, let's do it. Help me understand how you can use Coulomb's law to explain all of this. So, well, let's take the example of the current carrying wire kept close to a moving charge. Let's say you have a moving charge, you have a current carrying wire. We know it gets deflected either towards or away from it, depending on the charge. So let's ask Einstein, how do you explain that using Coulomb's law? Like how, how Einstein just says that, well, um, that's basically the force of attraction between charged particles. You have a charge over here, the current carrying wire is also charged and they just attract or repel each other. And I'll say, Einstein, hold on, the current carrying wire is not charged. So here is our current carrying wire, let's say the current is upwards and in let's say there's an electron, that's our moving charge, that's moving downwards. Then experiment shows that this electron actually gets attracted towards the wire. Okay, you can use your Lorentz force, you can use your right hand thumb rule, you can use your, I don't know, you have all those rules. You can use all of that, the traditional rules that we've learned in our classical um, electromagnetism courses, and you would actually see that the electron gets attracted towards it. But Einstein says that attraction is due to the charge of the wire. The wire is charged, and I'm saying the wire is uncharged. I mean, if you could, if you could peel into the wire, into the wire, then you have all the positive charges over here and you have all the electrons over here. The electrons are moving down because remember we assume the current is upwards. We assume the current is upwards, all right? So for every single proton, we will find there will be an electron. For every single positive charge, there will be an electron. And therefore, if you take any section of the wire, you will find that the total charge would be zero equal amount of positive and negative, and therefore the whole wire is neutral. And therefore I go back and Einstein says, how do you use Coulomb's law to explain this? This whole wire is neutral. Electric force cannot explain this. And Einstein comes back and says, hmm, Mahesh, remember we want to calculate the force on the moving charge. Therefore, we need to look at things from the perspective of the moving charge. In other words, we need to jump into the moving charges a reference frame to see what's really going on. And I say, okay, let's let's play along. Let's play along. This is the ref this is the lab reference frame, our reference frame, our reference frame in which the conductor appears to be at rest, but the, this electron, our moving charge is moving. Now let's jump into the electron's reference frame, this electron's reference frame and see what we see. Okay, and to keep things simple, let's just assume that the, the speed at which these electrons are moving down, that's causing the current, is the same as the speed of these electrons. We'll just do that for the convenience sake, okay? All right, so if we jump into the electrons reference frame, what will we see? Let's look at that. So this is the electrons reference frame. What will we see? Well, because the electron, this moving charge, our electron and these electrons are moving at the same speed, their relative speeds are zero, right? This relative speed is zero. So they will appear to be at rest with respect to each other. So let me get rid of this velocity vector, right? So in the pers from the perspective of this electron, all these electrons appear to be at rest. However, now these protons appear to be moving backwards. Just like when you're going in a car, the whole world appears to be moving backwards. These protons and the entire conductor appear to be moving backwards. So from the electron's perspective, this electron's perspective, the current is caused by the moving protons upwards, by the whole conductor is moving while the electrons are stationary. But does it look charged? to you? No, it still looks uncharged to me. For every single proton, there is an electron. If I take any section of the wire, I will find the same number of protons and electrons and therefore the whole thing still looks uncharged. And so I go back to Einstein and say, Einstein, it still looks, the wire still looks uncharged. How do you explain that there is a force acting on this electron without using magnetic fields? 
Einstein says, Mahesh, you forgot something. When you're changing reference frames, you can't really use Newtonian physics. You have to use Einstein's theory of relativity. That's the more accurate physics. And one of the results of Einstein's theory of relativity is that when things are moving, let's say when a pen is moving with respect to me, its length in the direction of motion shrinks. This is called length contraction. So when the pen is moving with respect to me, I would actually find its length to be smaller. And when the pen stops, the length becomes larger. This is a real effect. It sounds insane and crazy, and it's negligible at normal speeds, and that's why we don't usually notice it, but it's there at extremely high speeds, close to speed of light. This is very, very apparent. And so Einstein says, this is true, we have to use it. So what it means is that when things are moving with respect to us, the length shrinks, the atoms inside the, the, atoms inside the pen actually come closer to each other, and when moving things stop, the atoms go farther away from each other. You got that? This is called length contraction. We'll not worry about why that happens. We'll just accept Einstein's, we'll just take Einstein's word for it. But now let's see, let's use this in our situation. So when we jump from the lab reference frame to the electrons reference frame, the protons which were at rest start moving and the electrons which were moving come to a rest. So can we use Einstein's length contraction and see how the situation really looks. I want you to pause the video. It's, can you pause the video and see what the situation looks like and whether the wire looks charged after using link contraction? All right, let's see. Well, because the protons started moving, the whole conductor started moving, the whole conductor will shrink length contraction. Protons will come closer to each other when I look at it from the electrons reference frame. And therefore, this whole conductor, I have to shrink it. The whole conductor shrinks. I'm exaggerating the effect over here. The effect is actually very, very, very negligible, but I'm exaggerating it over here. And what about the electrons? Well, the electrons were moving. They come to a stop. Remember when things which are moving come to a stop, they go farther away from each other because the link contraction goes the other way around. So the electrons, they will go farther away from each other. Okay, and now if you look at the situation, you no longer have, I mean, you will actually see if you take any section of the wire, since the protons have come closer to each other, electrons have gone farther away from each other, the whole conductor has now become positively charged. And Einstein says, well, it's this positive charge of the conductor that attracts the electron towards it. Good old Coulomb's law. Beautiful, isn't it? When I first learned about this, it blew my mind away. The f there are many questions that come to my mind. The first question would be that, hey, is the force that we calculate using length contraction the same as the force that we get using our traditional magnetic fields and stuff? And the answer is pretty much yes. If you can actually calculate how much the length contraction happens and then you figure out how much the charge gets on this and then you actually use Coulomb's law and you figure out the force, you get the exact not the exact, there's one more effect that we need to consider from relativity, but pretty much the same answer. The second question that comes to my mind is, hey Einstein, you, you said that this effect of length contraction is very, very, very minimal and negligible at regular speeds, right? Um, the, over here, the protons are moving very slow, actually. They're not moving close to speed of light. They're crawling, actually, all right? So shouldn't the effect of length contraction be very negligible here as well? Yes, it is insanely negligible. However, and I've exaggerated over here, however, however, the important thing is there are so many protons. There are in so many protons and so many electrons that even when you consider this insanely negligible tiny effect, but you add it up for all the protons and electrons, you actually end up getting a macroscopic, like a big enough effect that you can see it in the lab, which means, as mind-blowing as it seems, this is one of the everyday examples of relativity coming in action. The very fact that moving charges get attracted to a current carrying wire is an everyday example of length contraction. How insane it is to think of it that way. Okay, but we're not done here. This is an example that you would see in most places, but I wanna take one more example. I had a third question. The third question I had is, cool, this explains why a current carrying wire acts like a magnet, behaves like a magnet, or feels like it behaves like a magnet. But what about a single moving charge? Why does a single moving charge uh, produces a magnetic field? 
And again, Einstein comes back and asks us, remember why you have to answer the question, why do you think so? Why do you say that a single moving charge produces a magnetic field? We can again say because a single moving charge can deflect a magnetic needle, but that's a more complicated example. Um, another example would be if I take another single moving charge, if I have two moving charges, let's say you have two electrons, all right? If the two electrons are moving with respect to me, if I see them moving, then here's an experimental fact, all right? We know that these electrons are gonna repel each other because of which we would expect the electrons to move away from each other. We can calculate the force of repulsion using Coulomb's law, right? And as a result, we can calculate how fast they go, fast they separate. But if you actually carry out this experiment, and I don't know how you're gonna carry this out, but if you do this, if you carry out this experiment, what you will find is that these electrons will be separating slower than expected. They will not be separating as quickly as you would want, as quickly as you would calculate from Coulomb's law. So the explanation for that as to why they're not as quickly separating as we would expect is because there is an additional force, a force of attraction between them, and this is the magnetic force. The two moving charges act like a magnet and they attract each other. This attractive force sort of dilutes the Coulomb's force, kind of not completely cancels out, but sort of cancels some part of the Coulomb's repulsion. As a result of that, the net force decreases. And as a result of that, the separation speed, the time it takes to separate also decreases. This is the traditional explanation for why two moving electrons separate slower than what we would expect from Coulomb's law. But now let's throw this to Einstein because according to Einstein, there is no such thing as magnetic field. That's what he's saying. So Einstein, how do you explain this? How do you explain that if you have two moving electrons parallel to each other, they separate slower than what you would get from Coulomb's law? Well, Einstein says, again, let's first jump into the electrons reference frame and see what we see. The electrons appear to be at rest with respect to each other, right? Because I don't see them moving. And now if I calculate how fast they would be separating, then, I mean, I, I don't see them moving this way. That's what I meant, okay. Now, if I um, think about how fast they would be moving apart using Coulomb's law, I'll get some answer. I'll see that they're separating with some speed, all right? Now, this is from the electrons reference frame. Now, what happens when I jump out to the lab reference frame? There's a second effect of Einstein's theory of relativity, which is called time dilation. This says that when something is moving with respect to you, their clocks tick slower with respect to you. All right. Which means if you have a friend that's saying bye to you and is moving with respect to you, he will or she will actually appear doing bye in slow motion. And the weird thing about this is that motion is relative. So if you were also saying bye to her, from her perspective, you're the one who's moving. And so she would say, my clock is ticking slower, our clock is ticking slower. So that's the relative part of it. Again, very negligible effect at everyday speeds. And so we don't usually see it, but it's true, it happens. Practically we've seen it. And uh, yeah, let's apply that to our situation and see how this helps us make sense of things. So again, from the electrons perspective, we've seen that they get separated and the speed is predicted by Coulomb's law. There's only Coulomb's force. But when I come out and jump into our reference frame, with respect to us, these electrons that are separating, these electrons are moving. With respect to us, these electrons are moving. And because these electrons are moving, with respect to us, their clock appears to take slower, which means the whole thing appears in slow motion. And it's for that reason, the separation also appears to be in slow motion. So Einstein says, the reason why the electrons are separating slower than we would expect is not because there's another mysterious magnetic force, there's only the Coulomb's force, it's just that due to time dilation, things have slowed down. And again, if you use the, the math of Einstein's relativity and calculate how much the time dilation is, you would get the exact same answer as you would find experimentally. So there's no need to cook this magnetic field. You can just say there's only Coulomb's law, but the reason it moves apart slower than you expected is not because there's a magnetic attraction, but because of time dilation, things slow down. That's it. That's the answer to it. And again, this is mind boggling if you think about it, right? So there could be more questions now. A question could be, so does it mean that there is no such thing as magnetic field at all? There's only electric field and there's only Coulomb's law. Can we say that? 
I don't think so. Not an expert on this, and this is the part where I'm coming to the edge of my knowledge. But I don't think that would be accurate because consider this, if you have a single electron or a proton for that matter, it's not moving. Let's say it's not moving at all. We would still find it can deflect a magnetic needle if you have a very sensitive needle. How do you explain that? It's not moving. So there's no, I cannot use relativity over here. No link contraction, no time dilation. If it's at rest, it can still deflect it. You may have heard about this idea called intrinsic electron spin, the magnetic field generated by electron spin. And clearly there's, as of now, I can't think of any way in which I can explain that without using Einstein's relativity. But if I go one step further, what's more important is instead of saying that, hey, there's no such thing as magnetic field, I think a more accurate statement would be something like, you know, something that appears to be a magnetic field in one reference frame can transform and appear to be an electric field in other, another reference frame. I think that's the bigger takeaway from Einstein's theory of relativity. And what that basically means is that electric and magnetic fields might be the same manifestation of something more fundamental underlying phenomena, which we called electromagnetic fields. So sometimes electromagnetic fields look to us as electric fields, sometimes they look to us as magnetic fields, sometimes they do look to us as both electric and magnetic fields, but at the heart of it is just one single electromagnetic field and therefore in physics we say there's one force, the electromagnetic force. We don't say electric and magnetic forces are two different forces of nature, we say they're one single forces of nature because they're actually unified and what unifies them um, are in our understanding is Einstein's theory of relativity. I have one last question for you because whenever you use Einstein's theory of relativity, there seems to be some kind of a paradox, apparent paradox, but when you think through it, you'll realize there is no such thing. So if I come back to this electron's reference frame, we're seeing from this electron's reference frame, um, the protons have come close to each other, electrons have gone farther apart from each other, the whole conductor has shrunk. What about charge conservation? There were no charges to begin with earlier, but now there is a charge on this conductor. Where did this extra charge come from? Imagine if this, imagine this was a part of a complete circuit over here. You can, there's a battery somewhere. Can you look at that complete circuit and somehow convince yourself where this extra charge comes from? Because relativity or not, charge conservation should hold true. When you change reference frames, you cannot suddenly have charge coming out. Charge is not relative concept. It's an absolute concept. You cannot suddenly create charges. Oh, you know, um, you cannot, Net charge cannot be created, that's what I mean. So, interesting to think about that, and yeah, I'll leave it to you, see you.